This is John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this happens to be the first Mail Call Mondays of the new year. So uh, thank you guys for sticking with us uh, over the years, and uh, hopefully we will still have this thing to do for several years to come. Uh, so we couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, our audience is what really causes us to keep going on this thing and putting in all the work. Uh, now, this Mail Call Mondays is the first Mail Call Mondays we've done after we return from the Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trade Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, uh, the SHOT Show is a yearly industry trade show uh, where manufacturers will usually bring out their latest and greatest products. It's where a lot of new products are released. It's a lot of uh, things that we get to see first uh, before the marketing information is put out and they're released to the general public. Uh, it's also a great chance for people like myself to actually go get some hands-on with some of the products and talk to reps face-to-face -face and ask them questions about the products. Uh, it's uh, also a whole lot of parties that go on after hours and a whole lot of other events that surround the show. So it really ends up being a solid week of work uh, for those of us that are doing media coverage. Uh, one of these days I keep telling myself I want to go to the SHOT Show and not bring a camera and just goof off and uh, pal around with people. Uh, but it doesn't happen every year. I end up bringing the camera and the microphone so I can get you guys some coverage of the show. Uh, so what we're going to do in this Mail Call Mondays is I'm going to talk about uh, specifically the industry day at the range. Uh, the way the SHOT Show is formatted, the actual SHOT Show in the Sands Expo Center occurs from Tuesday to Friday. Now that Monday, there is what's called Industry Day at the Range, and that is a live fire event at the Boulder Creek Rifle and Pistol Club. And uh, we are able to go out and actually shoot a lot of the new firearms that manufacturers bring out. Uh, it's really a good time because a lot of the things that we cover, it's difficult to get an idea of how they perform or to formulate intelligent questions about them uh, without actually being able to pull the trigger on them. Uh, so being able to get out to the range and get on the guns and uh, shoot them uh, is a great help to us. Uh, the unfortunate thing about Industry Day at the range is because it is on a live fire range, uh, it's very difficult to do interviews and actually get some audio. Uh, we shot some stuff with the Cobalt Kinetics guys uh, while we were out there, and the audio is not really to the level that I like, but I think we're going to go ahead and edit that and get it out to you guys uh, just because otherwise it's wasted footage and it just sits on my computer's hard drive. Uh, so I'd rather have it out to you guys, but again, it's not indicative of the quality of work that we generally do. Uh, so that caused me a little bit of concern. We didn't bring the wireless mics out there. Uh, we were basically shooting with a camcorder with a shotgun mic on it uh, because that allows us to get in and out and thread around the crowds uh, and not be out there carrying uh, 20 to 30 pounds worth of gear. Uh, we've also found in the past trying to set up tripods on those uh, lines cause a ton of problems. We get safety officials yelling at us. Uh, we get people tripping over them. So uh, this was our... Uh, chance to try to get in there and get some run and gun B footage. Uh, a lot of the clips that you'll see, uh, you don't see Sarah, and that's because uh, she was my camera woman uh, for pretty much the entire time that we were out there. So I really couldn't have done this uh, without her help. Uh, she makes things so much easier on me when we're out there. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get a chance to really get her in front of the camera, uh, but I'm working on that. Hopefully uh, going forward, we'll get her out there a little bit more. Uh, she did do some interaction out on range day, as you'll see in some of the clips we do, and I had hoped to have her here with me uh, to discuss some of the things that we saw, uh, but unfortunately she's a little bit under the weather right now, and I had to go ahead and shoot this so we can try to get this out to you guys in a timely manner. Now, enough of me talking about you know the generalities of SHOT Show. Uh, let's talk about some of the specific products uh, that I shot at Industry Day at the range. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is a rifle from Cobalt Kinetics. Uh, there were actually two different systems there that they, we shot. Uh, the first one and the one that I will post the clip uh, of the uh, rep talking about is the BAMF, the B-A-M-F. 
And this is kind of an interesting AR-15. Now, bear in mind that uh, everyone and their brother makes an AR-15 now. So it starts to really get diff difficult for companies uh, to find a way to make their product different from another or to make their product stand out. Uh, what Cobalt Kinetics has done uh, is they have what's called a dual drop bolt release on their rifle. Uh, now, if you picture a standard AR-15, you know down the right side of the AR-15, we have uh, the button for the forward assist. What Cobalt Kinetics did is they replicated that on the left side of the rifle as well. So it's actually an ambidextrous forward release or forward assist now. Uh, so you can use either side to make sure you've got your bolt seated. Well, that really isn't, you know, any kind of great advancement in the AR-15 platform. Uh, but what Cobalt Kinetics did is they turned the forward assist into a bolt release as well. So it still works as a forward assist, but if your bolt is locked to the rear, hitting the forward assist will drop the bolt. Now you have one on the left-hand side, so you can hit the forward assist on the left-hand side as well. Now, normally you'd start thinking, well, why would I want to do this? Well, kind of the neat thing about this is you can keep your hand on the pistol grip and you can actually drop that bolt uh, without moving your hand from the pistol grip. Uh, if you are shooting strong side and you have your thumb wrapped around the left-hand side of the receiver, uh, then you can just reach up and hit that left forward assist and that will drop the bolt uh, on a fresh magazine. Uh, if you're shooting support side, same thing. Your thumb is now on the right-hand side. You can reach up, pop that forward assist, and drop the bolt. So it's kind of a neat idea. You still do have a standard bolt release, so if you just can't wrap your head around that, you can still drive the magazine up in that beer can grip and then hit the bolt release with your thumb. Now, for some of you guys, you may not really uh, be into this. You may not think that that is a worthwhile reason to upgrade to a BAMF over a standard AR platform, uh, but it's kind of neat. It gives you some options. Uh, I'm still kind of on the fence on the utility of it uh, because of the way I reload the rifle. Uh, the idea behind the dual drop forward assist, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the dual drop bolt release is that you can keep the rifle up on target, you don't knock it around, and if you're a fan of the drive the magazine in and then slap the side of the rifle, it drives the rifle off target. It's difficult to keep it up and keep it on sight. If you do like I do, and when you come up with your reload and you drive it in, and then you come up with your thumb and hit that bolt release, well, the rifle's still on target. It's still a really stable platform, and as soon as I release that bolt, if I need to, I can fire from that position. Uh, so for me, there's less utility in this system uh, than maybe some other people. But it's a cool idea and I really like when companies truly try to innovate the AR-15 platform instead of just bringing out a different shaped lower receiver or a different shaped handguard uh, or, you know, shiny parts. Uh, so in this instance, it's really interesting. And of course, uh, the rifle is fully, it's a billet upper and lower receiver. Uh, it has their own proprietary handguard, their own proprietary buttstock. And there are two flavors of the BAMF. Uh, one comes in at $2,500. The higher trim level uh, comes in at just under $3,000. So those are kind of neat. Uh, the really interesting system that Cobalt Kinetics had out there was their Evolve rifle. And this has what's called the Cobalt Advantage Reload System. And you may have seen some clips uh, on the web about it or some uh, blurbs about it. Recoil did a little bit of a, a pre-release on it. What the Cobalt Advantage Reload System or the CARS system does for you as, as soon as you fire that last shot on the rifle, the bolt locks to the rear and the rifle automatically drops your magazine. Now, you're clear, you're ready to reload, you grab your reload off your belt, you drive it in, and as soon as that magazine seats, it automatically drops the bolt and you're ready to fire. Uh, now, Cobalt's uh, house shooters, uh, their sponsored shooters, uh, say it can save them up to a second on a reload. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's kind of a neat concept. Uh, however, what we saw at the industry day at the range is there were some reliability issues still with it. Uh, with the demo that we shot, uh, they had it down, they got it uh, back up and working, and I really want to thank them for actually getting it going so I could shoot it. Uh, 
because it was uh, up and down uh, during the time we were there. Uh, when I shot it uh, for a couple of the reloads, it would drop the magazine with the bolt forward on the last round. Now, in my opinion, that's not necessarily a bad thing because if it drops the magazine with the bolt forward on a live round, I know I need to reload, but I still have an emergency shot left. So if it does that, let's say I'm in a tactical environment, let's say this system was ready for prime time and I was a law enforcement officer with using this as my patrol rifle. Uh, when I fire that second to last shot, when it loads that last shot and dumps that magazine, I know I need to get more ammo into the system, but I have one shot left. So a guy comes around the corner, I can still pull that trigger and get the job done, even though there's no magazine in the well. Now, obviously, this causes a problem there because now I have to go through and uh, complete the reloading task and rack the uh, charging handle instead of just dropping the bolt. But I thought that was kind of neat. Come to find out that's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it is supposed to work is when you fire the last round and the bolt comes back on an empty magazine, that's when it's supposed to dump the magazine and lock the bolt to the rear. Then when you drive the fresh magazine in, it loads that first round and you're ready to go automatically. You don't have to push any buttons. Um, so uh, it was interesting to use it. It would take some training for someone that is used to listening and feeling for that recoil impulse. Uh, to go through the manual of operations because I did find myself uh, the first couple of times uh, when it kicked that magazine out, I was still reaching up uh, for the magazine. Uh, so it it's kind of strange, uh, but I think it's really interesting going forward. Now, what I thought was a little strange about this is they were mentioning competition. Uh, and for instance, uh, a lot of the competitions that are out there uh, they allow you to dump a magazine with rounds in it. Uh, so what competition shooters will do is they will program the stage into their head. They'll decide, I want to shoot this target, this target, this target, and I know I'm going to need this round, this many rounds when I hit this next firing position. So I'm going to want to reload here. Uh, so very often competition shooters are not reloading at slide lock. Uh, they are reloading on the way to another firing point or they're reloading before they turn a corner or before they get to a certain place uh, in that stage. So I don't know how much utility this is going to have for a true competition shooter. Uh, if they get the reliability down to 100%, uh, then it may be an interesting option for uh, tactical shooters because, again, then the rifle tells you absolutely that it wants another magazine uh, when it goes shooting that one out the bottom. Uh, it's still one of those that I'm, I'm really interested in. It. I want to see it going forward, uh, but I'm not really sure exactly where it fits. So uh, definitely check that out, and we'll leave a link to them down below. Uh, I don't have a price on the what the Evolve, what the car system is yet. Uh, I don't think they are ready for production, and I do not have an actual uh, time frame at this point uh, on when they'll be available. Uh, the next thing we slid over to Talon Grips booth. Uh, they had a little corner in there, and Talon Grips, uh, we've talked, I believe I've talked to you guys about them before. Uh, they make a decal type stick on grip uh, for Glocks and Smith and Wessons and a lot of the other handguns out there. And they make uh, some products for long guns as well. Uh, and basically it's uh, skate tape or uh, non-slip tape, but it's die cut to fit your handgun very well. And they do a really, really good job of cutting it out. Uh, Talon had a booth there where you could fire a naked gun and a Talon grip equipped gun side by side. And uh, I took this chance to shoot a Glock 26 side by side with a Talon grip equipped Glock 26. And it really does make a difference, even with a Gen 4 Glock 26 uh, versus a Gen, or, uh, Gen 4 G26 equipped with the Talon rubber grips. Um, I really felt like I had a better grip on the gun with the grips. And uh, there's no gimmick here. It's just my impression on how much better I can hang on to the gun. Now, my daily carry when I want to go concealed is a Glock G26. Uh, it's a Gen 3, so Gen 3s tend to be a little slippery. Uh, usually, this is not an issue for me because that thing is stuck against my skin. So a Gen 4 grip uh, would tear up 
my skin pretty good and it would wear out my clothing fairly quickly. Uh, so I don't really want that aggressive a grip. Uh, in addition, stippling really isn't an option for me on those guns because we run into that whole tearing up my skin, tearing up my clothing issue. I think the Talon grips are a great option and I will be putting one on my G26. I currently have one on my Glock 21 SF duty pistol uh, and I went with the Talon rubber grips over the Talon uh, grit uh, because those will actually be a little bit more gentle on my uniform and a little bit more gentle on the upholstery of my car. Uh, because uniforms are expensive and you will get to the point where you start to wear out the side of your uniform uh, where your handgun presses against it if you have a really aggressive grip texture on your gun. Uh, so the Talon grips so far I've been running them for a couple of months and on a duty pistol that is exposed to all kinds of wear I haven't had any problems at them at all. Um, I replaced a previous slip-on grip with the Talon grips, and it, it's a great, great, huge improvement. There's no squirming uh, when I really lock in that grip, uh, and I'll, I use a grip where I twist my arms inboard to lock the pistol in, and it causes a great amount of force on the actual grip of the handgun. And with slip-on grips, I would start to feel that squirm. Uh, with the Talon grips, it doesn't squirm. It just locks in, and it's good to go. Uh, so the Talon grips are really fairly inexpensive. Uh, they're less than 30 bucks, uh, and we'll leave a link to their website down below. Uh, thankfully, uh, I'll have a new grip in here soon to put on my G26, and we may do an installation video on that. So uh, next, we ran over to Peltor. Peltor had a static display. Unfortunately, they were a little bit further back from the firing line than I would have liked. I would have liked to have been able to put some of their new Ear Pro on uh, right up on the firing line. But we were still close enough to the firing line uh, that the reports of the firearms were causing the ear protection, the active ear protection, to do its thing. Uh, we got to try uh, two new models that Peltor has released this last year. Uh, one is the Range Guard, and I'm really interested in the Range Guard because these are active hearing protection. Uh, they do amplify voice and they amplify ambient noises, uh, but they attenuate gunshots. And these come in at the $60 price point. I believe they're on uh, Midway right now for $59.99. And they really are a nice low-profile option. They seem to be a great option for the budget-minded shooter. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a set in and we can actually do a long-term evaluation on them uh, because uh, Sarah gave them a try and they she really has some problems with getting uh, over-the-ear hearing protection to fit. She usually prefers just to use foam earplugs. Uh, and these, I think, were working out fairly well for her. They conformed really well uh, when wearing ear pro or eye protection underneath them. Uh, and she didn't seem to have a problem with them. So hopefully we'll get a set in. We'll let her give them a try since she has uh, a lot of issues with Ear Pro. And uh, hopefully she can give you her opinion on those as well. Um, what I was interested in is the Tactical 100. Now this seems to be a replacement for the old 6S. And they uh, refined quite a few features on them. First of all, they moved the battery doors to the outside. Uh, so you no longer have to rip your uh, Ear Pro apart to replace your batteries. Uh, they made the knobs lower profile, so they're a little bit more difficult to engage inside your range bag. Uh, they do have an automatic shutoff, so again, you don't run into issues like you have with the 6S, uh, where you pull them out of the bag and the batteries are always dead. Uh, if you've been around a lot of shooters, uh, you'll notice that if they're wearing 6S, they probably don't have the knobs on them anymore. And it's not because they've lost the knobs. Uh, more than likely is because they pulled the knobs off so they don't get inadvertently turned on in the shooting bag. Uh, so that was an issue and they tried to address all those. Uh, one of the really cool features on the Tactical 100 is they feature what's called variable suppression time. And this is when you are wearing Ear Pro and you hear that gunshot. Um, really good Ear Pro uh, will limit the amount of time that they attenuate the sound. Uh, picture you're talking to a guy and somebody's shooting in the background. Well, if the suppression time is too long, uh, then when the gunshot fires, the ear pro drops that uh, volume down to protect your ears, and then it waits a while while it ramps it back up. Uh, during that time, you're not really hearing the ambient noises. You're at the full suppression level of the ear pro, just like they would be turned off. Uh, so the... Really, for good ear pro to be able to use during a class or while you're interacting with somebody, uh, you want really short suppression time. 
the problem with short suppression time is uh, sometimes it does not catch echoes. Uh, so if you're in an indoor shooting range or you're in a uh, concrete or tin roof covered area, uh, then when you're firing, uh, you may get the initial attenuation for the gunshot, but then you may get the echoes off of that, and that may really not be comfortable for you. Uh, obviously, it's still not going to be to the point where it's damaging your hearing, uh, but it's just not pleasant. Uh, so what Peltor has done is they have allowed you, with the volume knob, to adjust the suppression time. Now, it's kind of counterintuitive uh, when they explain it to you, but... The lower the volume, the shorter the suppression time. So the quicker it attenuates that gunshot and comes back. The higher the volume level, the longer the attenuation time. So if you really crank that volume all the way up to the max, uh, it will stretch out that time to suppress the gunshot as long as it possibly can. I'm not sure exactly why they chose to go that direction. I would generally think that you would want to go the opposite direction, where the lower the volume, the longer the suppression time. Uh, in my mind, if you are in a noisier environment like an indoor range, you're going to want to turn that volume down a little bit. Uh, however, uh, their engineers, I'm sure, figured out which of those two was the best way to go, and that's the way they went with it. Uh, now, the drawback to it is I really would like to have two separate settings, one setting to allow me to adjust the suppression time and another to allow me to adjust the volume. Uh, but I think that may have been a price point consideration. And these guys come in at $79.99, so it's still a really reasonable uh, price point. Now, the out of the Peltor lineup, my preference right now is still for the Tactical Sport. Uh, those offer the best comfort, best fit, I think, and you can install the gel ear seals in those. Some of the new Peltor models uh, will not accept the gel ear seals. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get uh, both the Range Guard and the Tactical 100s in, and we'll be able to give you guys a little bit more information on them as we get them out to the range and get some time on them. Well, we couldn't stop our range day trip without going over to IWI and checking out the new X95 and the 300 Blackout Tavor. Uh, I am not a huge bullpup fan, and one of the reasons I wasn't a huge bullpup fan is I had this misconception about uh, being able to shoot bullpups from support side. I really don't want a tactical rifle, a rifle I may have to use in a serious situation that I can't shoot from the support side. Any of you that have any kind of CQB background know that when you're flowing through a house or you're flowing through a structure or you're utilizing cover outdoors, when you go to cover that is exposed on the support side, you need to switch to that support side shoulder so that when you come out, you're only exposing what you need to expose to engage the target. You don't have half your body, you don't have a bunch of your legs hanging out the side. Uh, you can stay minimally exposed and still engage the target. Uh, with a bullpup that is ejecting right where your cheek would go, uh, that's kind of difficult. Well, the Tavors don't, the Tavor and the X95 don't really eject right where your cheek is at. It's a little bit further down, a little bit further forward, but I was still concerned about catching brass in my grill. Um, I you know, may look kind of tough, may look kind of cool, but I don't want a mouthful of brass uh, at the end of a shooting session. So talking to the guys there at IWI, they said this really is an issue. You can shoot from both sides. And I actually took some time to shoot support side, uh, or rather strong side, support side, strong side, support side. And I just went back and forth shooting a couple rounds from each side and I was able to flow back and forth and shoot with no problems whatsoever. So that's really sparked my uh, interest now in the bullpups, uh, specifically the IWI bullpups. Uh, now the Tavor is kind of old news. Everybody knows about the Tavor. Um, they have now brought out a 300 blackout version uh, and it functioned perfectly while we were there. Of course, the only problem you have there is if you have a 5.56 Tavor, make sure you know which one you're grabbing. You don't want to be that guy that goes ahead and loads up a bunch of 300 blackout through a 5.56 and uh, really tears up that barrel and blows the system up. Uh, now, thankfully I made sure when I test fired the 300 uh, that we were getting the right magazines in and that we were getting the right ammunition in it. And it worked great. Uh, 
felt just fine. I really couldn't tell a whole lot of difference between the uh, supersonic 300 blackout Tavor and the 556 Tavor. I uh, didn't get a chance to shoot subsonic ammo through it, so I don't know what kind of function uh, the 300 black Tavor is going to have with subsonic ammo. Uh, I don't know that we're going to delve into actually trying to get a sample in to review because that's really starting to get outside of what our main track is. But it was a cool gun to shoot and uh, you never know, I may end up with one in my stable in the not too distant future. I did get to shoot the X95 and that is a really sweet system. Uh, the controls are moving more towards AR type controls. Uh, you still do have the bolt release in the rear. Uh, you still are dropping the magazine with the uh, magazine button in about the same position that it is on an AR. Uh, and the selector is kind of where you would expect it to be on an AR. So a guy like me, uh, coming from mainly AR platforms, the X95 is a really good option. Uh, it did take a little bit to remember that my charging handle is up on the side, and it is ambidextrous charging handle, uh, but you know it's uh, uh, something to keep in mind. And like any platform, going from an AR to an X95 uh, would take a little bit of retraining, or at least a little bit of familiarization to get the uh, manual of arms down. Now. Like the Tavor, the X95 can be converted uh, to left or right eject. Uh, so those of you guys that are lefties, uh, you have the option of setting up the rifle however you want to set it up. And it is really nice to have a non-regulated uh, item uh, in that short a package. What would be my non-regulated is it is not a short barrel rifle. You don't have to pay a $200 tax stamp and you don't have to register it. And then you don't have the restrictions traveling state to state that you do with an SBR. And by restrictions, I mean notifying the ATF and getting approval before you go into a different state with your SBR. Uh, so that is one of the things that really interests me about uh, the IWI uh, product offerings. Now, of course, Desert Tech uh, is getting a little closer to having their MDR out. Unfortunately, uh, there were no MDR live fires at SHOT Show, so I didn't get a chance to go out and live fire it. Uh, Desert Tech is going to let us know whenever it is ready for live fire demos, and hopefully we'll be able to get out there and get on the new Desert Tech rifle. Uh, next, we ran over to Glock, and Glock has released their new MOS, their Optics Ready Platforms, and... Previously, they had the, Gen, or the G34 Gen 4 uh, in the Optics Ready setup, so a section of the slide is cut out and has a block-off plate on it, and it comes with adapter plates to allow you to place whatever optics you want on the pistol. Um, the Glock has now released a G17 and a G19 version. So all you guys that like to have a compact carry pistol and put, say, a uh, Trigicon, or uh, Delta Point or some kind of other uh, mini red dot on it, uh, you now have that option. And I think it's really cool that you're gonna spend uh, just a little bit extra over the base pistol uh, to get the MOS version. And you'll be able to uh, grab your optic at home and drop it right on there. You don't have to send your slide out for machining. And of course, it is still covered by Glock's warranty. Uh, if you send your slide out and have a big chunk cut out of it, Glock may decide not to cover your individual problem under warranty. Uh, so that's really neat. And what I think is great about it uh, is this opens up a little bit more leeway for guys in law enforcement to be able to put optics on their pistols. Uh, now, that's a little bit of a discussion that's outside of this video. I'll get into the pros and cons of law enforcement officers uh, putting optics on their pistols later on if you guys want to hear that argument, uh, but we'll not get into it here. But it is nice that there is that advantage uh, that an officer could, if his department allowed him, to place an optic on his pistol and not void the warranty and not do any strange modifications to it. Uh, so really nice. Uh, I was going to put in an order for another Glock uh, right before we headed out to the show. I'm glad I held off on that because I will probably order the optics ready version uh, whenever they are available to ship. Uh, so we will do our best to uh, get those in. Now one thing that I keep noticing and the reason I'm interested in the optics ready platform is uh, I am horrible, horrible at shooting optics equipped handguns. 
Uh, I can't tell you why. The only thing I can think of is that when I drive the pistol up, I'm tracking that front sight. Uh, and when you put an optic on the gun, uh, the optic obscures the front sight. So I think it is messing up uh, my ability to track and drive that front sight onto target uh, when I'm shooting at high speed. Uh, I don't have any problems you know, shooting bullseye uh, with an optics equipped pistol, but shooting defensive type drills uh, where I'm coming up really fast and trying to get a shot off, uh, the optics equipped pistols actually slow me down. So I need to get one, I need to get it set up, and I need to go out and train with it uh, because it's obvious that it's an advantage. Uh, it's just not an advantage for me right now. So really excited about the new Glocks. Uh, Want to get one in and get it set up and do some training with an optics equipped pistol. Next, we rolled over to CMC and CMC released their new AK trigger this year. Uh, now, uh, Geisley actually uh, ALG Defense released an uh, AK trigger last year and uh, their AK trigger comes in at about the uh, 50 to $60 price point. And we actually bought one and installed one in our AK and it's a really, really high quality trigger. It's what you expect from a ALG or a Geisley product. Uh, so we were really interested that CMC has released a new trigger this year. I don't even believe it's up on their website yet, uh, but their AK trigger comes in at a $220 price point and it is competitive with what their two stage uh, AR triggers are. And the neat thing with the CMC trigger is it utilizes the similar design to their other triggers where you have an aluminum block uh, that the trigger components, the fire control group, is mounted in. Uh, and that's adjusted and set at the factory and shipped to you, ready to go, ready to drop into your rifle. Uh, CMC claims that their trigger will fit any AK platform. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you have a stamped, a milled, you know, whatever, this trigger should drop in. And because they're controlling the position of the fire control components with their internal aluminum block, uh, they don't have to worry about the variances in the pinholes in the various AK receivers. Uh, we did get to shoot uh, their demo rifle out there and it is a very clean, very crisp trigger. It has a very nice reset on it. It is definitely not AK-like. Uh, they do have a variety of trigger configurations, so you can get a curved trigger, you can get the flat trigger, you can get a trigger that looks very much like a factory AK if you want that external uh, design to stay the same. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, uh, it's really, that's starting to hit the high price point for an AK trigger. I don't know a lot of guys out there that have match AKs and at $220, you're hitting the point uh, where precision rifle triggers are at. So it'll be interesting to see how the market receives this. Uh, don't get me wrong, it felt very, very nice and is a very good trigger. Uh, and if that is what you're looking for, uh, then I say, you know, gas on with it. Now don't get me wrong, CMC makes a very, very good product. The AK trigger felt very good. I'm just curious to see how the market will receive a $220 AK trigger. But uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you, would you put a $220 trigger in your AK? Uh, if it meant you didn't have any trigger slap, you had a match grade trigger pull and that kind of platform. I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Well, after we were done at CMC, we cruised on over to Tracking Point. Uh, initially, I almost went right by Tracking Point because uh, we've experienced their system before, uh, shot it on several different occasions, and for the type of shooting that I do, uh, precision rifle competition style shooting, uh, the Tracking Point system really did not interest me greatly. Uh, as an academic exercise, I think there is great promise in the system. Uh, from the professional standpoint, from a military sniper, I think that those systems are going towards where the future of military sniping is at. Uh, the cost of the systems, even when they eventually get everything down to where I would like to see it, is probably going to be cost prohibitive for all but the largest departments on the law enforcement side. Uh, so I really think that this is going towards the military shooting or the high budget hunters. Uh, the system was originally kind of constructed for hunters out there so that a guy could uh, drop a serious amount of coin on the system, go out, and be almost assured to hit on the game animal. Uh, now, the limitation previously on the tracking point system uh, was the 
cycle of operations that you had to go through to engage a target. Uh, you had to put your reticle on the target. You had to press a button which tagged the target. Uh, it then told the system that that's what you want to shoot. Uh, the system would then laze the target. Uh, it would calculate the drop. It would calculate all the environmentals. It would give you a firing solution based on your wind input. You still had to go in and use a toggle switch on the top of the unit uh, to input what you felt the wind call was at the time. So you still had to have a Kestrel or you still had to uh, look down range and look at Mirage uh, and get a good idea of what's going on before you dial that in. Uh, so if you blew your wind call, you could still blow the shot, uh, which anybody will tell you wind is one of those things that separates a good shooter from a great shooter. Uh, but the, uh, so that little cycle, uh, you had to go through, you had to do all that, and then once the firing solution was computed, uh, you pressed the trigger and you held the trigger to the rear. The weapon did not fire at that point. You then had to move and place the sighting cues in the optic over the tag, and once you placed the reticle over the tag, the tracking point system would release the sear and the shot would fire. Uh, this all basically required you to put your, input, your wind input in correctly, and you had to have the shot lined up correctly. Now the advantage there is twofold. First of all, uh, it totally prevents trigger slap. It's impossible for you to slap the trigger. Uh, the rifle releases the shot, so it is a surprise break uh, when the two points line up and the rifle fires. Uh, it also allows you, if you're in a slightly unsteady position, uh, the rifle will not fire until it's on target. Uh, so if you're shooting from a little bit of a shaky shooting sticks or something of that nature, uh, then you're good to go. Uh, current models now have optical stabilization in the sight. Uh, so that it is much easier for you to set up an offhand shot with the system uh, than it was previously. But this whole cycle of operations meant that uh, me as a shooter, I could not override the system. So let's say I decided that there was a 5 mile an hour wind downrange, and I plugged a 5 mile an hour wind into the system. I got on target, I'm getting ready to break the shot, and I see either the veg or the mirage or something, I see the wind condition change. Uh, let's say all of a sudden the wind dropped off to nothing. Uh, well, normally with one of my rifles, even if I dial wind in and I watch the wind drop, I could just swing the reticle over, use a little bit of uh, Kentucky windage, and fire the shot and be good to go, uh, based upon my experience and what I know my wind needs to be. Uh, the tracking point system would not allow you to do that. Those tags have to be lined up. The reticle has to be on the tag before the rifle will fire. You couldn't override it. Well, I learned this time around that tracking point has something called a suppressive fire mode. Now, I don't know if it was always part of it, but they weren't advertising or they weren't discussing it. Uh, but the suppressive fire mode is actually a really interesting option for tracking point system. And it makes it more interesting to me because I can now have more control over the system. Uh, what the suppressive fire mode allows you to do is it allows you to uh, put your rangefinder cue on a target, you press the tag button and hold it, and it will come up with a firing solution uh, for that target. It will then alter your reticle to show your firing point on the reticle. Uh, it just gives you a cue and says, this is where you need to hold uh, to engage the target. Uh, that actually becomes the center of the crosshair now, and you will still have a cue showing where your 100-yard zero was at. It's kind of really neat because if a close-range target pops up, uh, you can still move and fire on that close-range target. Now, since the center of the crosshair is now my aiming point, and I actually have mill markings on the horizontal stadia, uh, this is the perfect situation for me to use the horizontal stadia for wind holds. Uh, now I have control over my wind hold, and I can do whatever I need to do. Uh, the other thing is that in suppressive fire mode, I have control of when the shot breaks. Uh, the trigger works like a traditional trigger. Uh, you don't, the system will not release the shot. Uh, you're pressing the trigger releases the shot. Now, of course, the disadvantage of this is uh, you can slap the trigger, you can blow the shot uh, if you don't use proper trigger control. So you remove some of the advantages of the system uh, but you get much more control over how the shot is set up. Uh, and for me, if you're shooting multiple targets, 
uh, that is a whole lot nicer way to go. Now, uh, Tracking Point has some other uh, changes in their software that I did not get a chance to test out. That was the main thing that I wanted to test out because if I was going to take this system and if it was legal for me to go shoot a PRS match with this system, that is the mode that I would use at this point. Uh, my ability to actually uh, laze the target and then have control over my wind holds uh, finitely uh, really, really interests me. Now, of course, the disadvantage is we were shooting their M800 system, uh, and this is a $16,000 rifle system. Uh, that's optic, rifle, everything ready to roll. Uh, and this was a 20-inch barrel, I believe, 308. Uh, so you, you have some disadvantages there. Now, I was told that they're capping the system at 800 yards. Uh, the system that we were shooting, we were actually going out, I think our longest shot was 840 with it, and it was still computing the firing solution. We were still getting hits uh, out beyond 800. Uh, so I'm not sure what the actual limitations of the systems are versus the... Uh, published limitations of the system are. Uh, one thing that limits the range on them is the laser range finder because they are trying to minimize everything to get it packed into that optical package. Uh, so they're running lower power laser range finders than the top level stuff that's on the market right now. Uh, additionally, there are some limitations on uh, the wind drift of the bullet uh, and various other things in there that I think are causing them to artificially limit it. Uh, if you go out and you look at uh, the Tracking Point 338 uh, platform out there, uh, it says that that system is rated out to three quarters of a mile. Uh, well, those of you that are actually 338 shooters, you know that it's fairly simple to take a 338 well out past a mile. Uh, so they are kind of limiting the cartridge capabilities in order to stay within the envelope that the platform allows for. So an interesting system. I'm, I'm not sure where the future of the system is going. Uh, I hope to see them keep advancing it because there are some technologies coming online now uh, that will allow a system to read what the wind is downrange. Uh, most of those are still kind of in the classified stages. They're still military tech, uh, but as they bleed out into the civilian sector, uh, we're eventually going to see laser range finders that will not only give me the distance to a target, it will tell me uh, what the average wind speed is between me and the target. Uh, so some really interesting tech that I'm sure will eventually uh, totally change the way we look at these kinds of systems. Uh, but probably not something that the entry-level guy who wants to go out and shoot rifle competitions is going to be interested in. And the last thing that we went and checked out out at Industry Day at the range was the Ruger Precision Rifle. And this is finally my first chance to get on a Ruger Precision Rifle. And I can tell you, uh, right off the bat, I really, really like what I see. I don't know that I've got on anything else out there for that price point that really feels as good, has as many adjustment options, and has what the Ruger Precision Rifle has to offer. Uh, I love the fact that you can throw uh, P mags into it. So you could run a 20 round uh, 7.62 mag in that thing. It'll take uh, M14 mags, AR10 mags, SR25 mags, AICS. Uh, didn't get a chance to see if it would take AW magazines, uh, but really, why would you want to go with an AW magazine if you can throw in a uh, 10 or 20 round P mag? So, uh, when we actually got on the show floor, I got to talk to one of the project engineers, and uh, hopefully we will have a Ruger Precision Rifle in to actually do a full review, because I'm very, very excited about this rifle. Uh, if it performs the way it should perform, uh, it may become my go-to recommendation for guys that are wanting to get in to Precision Rifle competition. Uh, so we'll check that out. And the big advantage of the Ruger Precision Rifle uh, is that the aftermarket seems to really be supporting it, so other manufacturers are coming out with accessory parts for it. Uh, you can use whatever AR-15 buttstock and whatever AR-15 pistol grip floats your boat. Uh, Seekins already has a handguard out for it, and it doesn't use an AR-15 barrel nut, but it uses that style nut on there. And you can take an AR armor's wrench, spin that guy off there, and you can change the barrel like you can change the barrel on a Savage. Uh, so that gives you some great options. 
Uh, one thing I will clarify, when you look at it, it looks like it's an AccuTrigger on that uh, Ruger. It is not. It is a Ruger proprietary trigger system uh, that uses a blade in the trigger similar to the AccuTrigger, but how that blade actually functions is considerably different. Uh, so some of the troubles that we've had with AccuTriggers in the past should not be present in this trigger uh, on the Ruger Precision Rifle. So really interested to get that guy in there. Um, we did come back from shot with uh, a couple of products from several different manufacturers that we will be getting out and reviewing as we go forward. Uh, most notably, uh, we do have one of the new Timney Calvin Elite two-stage triggers on deck, and we'll be getting that into a test rifle and get out and play with it. Uh, we've already got the Timney uh, video that we shot in their booth up online. Uh, we will leave a link to our playlist for our SHOT Show 2016 videos, and we'll be putting more of those up uh, going forward through the rest of the week. Uh, we've got a good handful of videos left uh, to get up there, and that's why I'm not covering actually what we did on the show floor as much as Industry Day at the Range. Uh, so please check that out. We also have the Brian Litz, Todd Hodnett, and Nick Vitalbo video that we shot in the Kestrel booth. And uh, if you haven't listened to Brian Litz and Todd Hodnett discuss ballistics or Nick Vitalbo discuss software, uh, it's a really great video for you to go watch. So make sure you check that out. If you guys have any questions about anything I covered in this video or anything at SHOT Show, please go ahead and post it in the comments section below. Uh, this was a pretty packed show for us. Uh, we still didn't get to some of the booths that we wanted to get to, uh, but that is usually how it always goes down. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but we had a great time there, and uh, we hope you guys enjoy the coverage. So until next time, get out and shoot!